is by Andrew Polstrom. He's going to speak about sector signatures harder than you think. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Is my mic cool? All right. Um, all right. So I was scheduled to talk about the history of Schnorr signatures in Bitcoin. Um, and I wanted to do that. And then I realized I've only got, you know, like 20 or 30 minutes to talk here. And I thought instead I'm just going to focus on one particular piece of that history, which is the security model surrounding um, not just Schnorr signatures, but the kind of extensions to Schnorr signatures that we really care about. And... Um, and I'm just going to focus on how the security model evolved as we started doing this. Um, so let me start by describing what a Schnorr signature is. So there are two purposes, depending on, on what part of the audience you're in, I guess, to this slide. One is to intimidate you with algebra, but the other is the opposite, to show that what a Schnorr signature is, is really just this one simple equation. And for a bit of context, a Schnorr signature is a digital signature algorithm that has been proposed for inclusion in Bitcoin to replace the existing ECDSA algorithm for a number of reasons, one of which being algebraic simplicity. You can see that the signature consists of these two objects. I'm not going to say what they are because I, I don't want to do a math lecture here, and I promise there won't be too many more equations. Um, you have these two objects. They're computed by these two simple equations. You notice the only operations here, there's an H there, that's a hash function, and there's a plus sign, and I guess there's multiplication. When two things beside each other are multiplication. Um, there's no division, there's no modular inversion, there's nothing exotic, there's no like computing an elliptic curve point and taking an x-coordinate or anything else. This is all like really straightforward, like grade 9 algebra kind of stuff. Gives us a Schnorr signature. And you would think, seeing an equation like this and having gotten through grade 9 algebra, that maybe you could turn this into a proposal for Bitcoin and uh, and that would be very straightforward, and you could do it, and then a month later you'd have some sort of BIP or something, and we can all fight about deployment strategies and minor collusion and all of that good stuff. But in fact, it turns out there's a lot more to, um, to Schnorr signatures than just a simple equation. What this equation gives you basically is that the equation, that the signature is correct, that somebody who knows the secret key X is able to produce a signature. But there's an inverse property that cryptographic objects need to have, that signatures need to have, which is security. It's not, it's not just important that a signer be able to produce a signature, it's important that nobody else can produce a signature who doesn't have a secret key. So let me try to formalize this intuition, and we'll get into why, uh, why this might be difficult. By the way, this is a verification equation. That's a signing equation, verification. The difference is just this, and that goes into some algebraic simplicity arguments that I don't, I, I want to talk about, but I don't have time. Um, so, what does it mean for a signature to be secure? Um, well, first off, you need to define your attacker somehow. If you want to formalize this, and the way that we do this is we say, well, an attacker is any probabilistic polynomial time algorithm, meaning basically any computer program, any, anybody who has a realistic amount of hardware and who doesn't, um, notice any realistic amount of hardware, Let's say, including like a quantum computer, for example, although, as we'll see later, it turns out our signatures are not secure against quantum computers. But we define an attacker as basically anything that is operating within the physical universe. It has only what's called a polynomial amount of time and space to work with, which basically, for our purposes, means, means practical. And there are fun philosophical reasons why those are interchangeable. Um, so the intuition we have for signatures is that nobody can sign a message without knowing a secret key. And if you're trying to formalize that, you might say, well, suppose I had a polynomial time algorithm that could produce a signature. Then maybe I could somehow use that algorithm to extract a secret key from it. And if any such algorithm would be amenable to this kind of modification, then it must be that like, somehow morally the algorithm knew the secret key in the first place and we're good, right? Um, well, no. I mean, that is a... a um, <laughs> a good way to think about it, but that's not sufficient. Because in fact, it's possible to create fake signatures without knowing a secret key in case you have uh, a sufficiently broken signature algorithm. So for example, you can imagine a signature algorithm where the verification process was like, you sort of look at it, and if it's got enough bytes, then it's a signature. Um, this is something that's trivially forgeable in the sense that any pile of bytes is going to be 
a forgery, according to our definition. But it is not going to, uh, it's not going to be secure. Right? Anybody can produce a sufficient pile of bytes. So we need to, to change this from just extracting secret keys to maybe forgeries. So now we say, well, can, uh, can an attacker be created that will sign some message that I choose? And if nobody can sign this message that I choose, then uh, maybe that's sufficient for security. And well, that's not really strong enough. Let's say the attacker is allowed to choose the message. Okay? So now our security definition is going to be no probabilistic polytime algorithm is able to choose a message and forge a signature. That sounds, um, that sounds pretty good, right? I mean, that sounds pretty general. We're letting any algorithm run. We're letting it choose a message. We're letting it produce a forgery. What more could we need? In fact, there are insecure signatures that are secure under this definition. One example is, uh, is say, Winternet's signatures, uh, which are used by some altcoins out there. Um, the way these signatures work is that they're so-called one-time signatures. If somebody produces enough signatures, and anybody who sees those signatures is able to extract parts of the secret key and then create a forgery. So the security definition where we said nobody can um, create a forgery somehow failed to capture this property that this algorithm needs to be able to get signatures. Um, or rather, if the algorithm can see signatures, then maybe that will help it. So let's strengthen this definition. We'll say we define an attacker with a probabilistic polytime algorithm. It is allowed to request signatures on whatever series of messages that it wants, and we have to give it to the algorithm, and they have to be valid signatures. And then given that, the attacker is allowed to choose another message and then produce a forgery on that, and then ask for more signatures, say, if it wants. Um, if, well, once it's forged, that won't help it, but in a lot of protocols, we, we uh, let it do queries between everything that it does just to make sure that it has as much power as it possibly can. And morally, what we're doing here is we're trying to define an attacker to be as powerful as is reasonably possible, where reasonably means can we still prove security against such attackers. Okay, so we just want to keep on giving the attacker more and more power, and hopefully um, we will get to a point where it seems clear that there is no, like in principle, there's no more powerful adversary that even makes sense to be called an adversary, right? We started out by saying an attacker is somebody who can extract secret keys, well that's very specific. What we really care about is forging signatures. And then we say, well, we want the attacker to, uh, to have as much information as it might possibly need for this. Um, so we'll let it ask for a whole bunch of other signatures. In fact, even this isn't really enough. Uh, our attacker here, suppose we want to prove that Schnorr signatures are secure. Maybe you could define an attacker that's allowed to request ECDSA signatures with the same key, or like zero knowledge proofs with the same key, or like just like weird different functionality. And if you want to do that, you get into a security model called universal composability, which I definitely don't have time to go into, but it's much stronger than anything I want to consider here. Um, but there are still a few intuitive ways that you can strengthen this. You can say, well, maybe the attacker is allowed to request a signature on the message it's going to forge on. In this case, you don't want to let it just give you back the signature that you gave it. That doesn't count as a forgery. So we say they have to give you a different signature, but you can do that. And then something relevant to Bitcoin is this last point, which is what if you let the attacker choose the signing key? Well, of course, if your attacker chooses a signing key, then of course they can produce signatures. So that's not, we can't just let the attacker choose a key. But suppose that we give it a uh, public key, and we want the, um, and we say, well, the attacker is allowed to derive like BIP32 child keys from this. Can it produce forgeries then? And it turns out, actually, the answer would be yes for a more naive form of Schnorr signatures, where in this middle line, this E is this hash, of, of a public key, this R object in the message. If we didn't have the public key in there, in fact, the resulting signature scheme would be insecure against that more general model. Um, so these, uh, these definitions that I've described, I've kind of rattled them off. But these are actually standard definitions in the literature. The one where the attacker can request a bunch of messages is what it means to be a secure signature. An a signature secure against existential forgeries under a chosen message attack. Chosen message meaning the signer can choose the message. Um, existential meaning, sorry, existential means they can choose a message. Chosen message means they can request signatures. Um, if we allow it to request signatures on the message it's going to forge, it's called a strong signature, which is slightly stronger. And if we let it choose a key, this actually, as far as I know, there's not really a name for this definition in the literature because most of the academic signature literature throughout the 90s and 2000s does not consider this as part of a security model. It assumes that 
a, um, a public key is somehow associated to the, some person, to some identity, um, to like your key fob when you try to, to get into the building, and that's not going to change. And so you just take the public key as fixed, you define your signature security assuming a fixed key, and move on with your life. And we already see a hint that maybe things are not so simple in Bitcoin by the fact that this is insufficient to protect forgeries using BIP32 child keys from signatures on the parent key. Okay? So, in fact, there's even, even more than just the, the security definition that I want to talk about here that, that gives some difficulties uh, when trying to deploy this stuff in practice. One is that in my first slide where I had those equations, I, to make it look less scary, I didn't mention that some of the values that you need need to be uniformly random. And uniformly random means essentially any probabilistic polytime algorithm is unable to distinguish the, the um, values generated by whatever you're claiming to be uniformly random from an actually uniformly random thing. And that's actually not a circular definition. But again, I'm not going to go into why. Um, so in real life, uniform randomness is hard to come by, especially if you are signing with like a key fob or like a hardware wallet or something with um, constrained uh, ability to gather randomness from the environment and something that needs to run in low power. Um, and one thing you might ask is, well, what happens if you screw up? the randomness. Suppose you're supposed to generate a 256-bit random number, but actually your seventh bit is usually one, say, more often than half. What is the danger in that? And it turns out the danger in that is that if you produce enough signatures, you will leak your secret keys. There is no room for, uh, for biased randomness at all, which is frustrating because when you read a paper describing a signature scheme, there's sort of this symbol, it's an arrow with a dollar sign above it, which means uniformly random, drawn from a uniformly random distribution. And that little symbol is sort of not something that anybody thinks about. But in real life, you have to think about this. It's very frustrating. You think, well, suppose I don't have a hardware random number generator. Suppose I'm worried that it's biased. It's like, what, what am I going to do? Um, and even if I think that I can produce uniformly random values, how can I convince anybody that they're uniform? How can I convince anyone that I didn't somehow backdoor this randomness so it's biased? in some way. And I could even, I could even buy it, bias it in very um, difficult to detect ways. And so, uh, so this is something that we worry about. So there's a standard solution to this, which is that you take this value k, which is part of your signature, which needs to be uniformly random, and you hash your secret key in the message. And we assume that our hash function is uniformly random in some nebulous sense called, uh, called the random oracle heuristic. And it turns out that this assumption if your hash function is something like SHA-256, has held up very well in practice. Um, it's not really random. In particular, if you, uh, if you give the same input to the function over and over, you will keep getting the same uh, output, right? I mean, a random, you think that a random output would change. Um, and it's also not really random in that if I give you a SHA-2 evaluator, you can plug stuff into it, and you'll be able to, to predict what the output will be. But because I'm going to put my secret key in here, and I'm going to assume that my secret key is unguessable, if I take a hash function sort of seeded with a secret key, we can treat that as uniformly random for our purposes. And this is great. This works. This is actually people do this. Um, it works very well. The result of hashing the secret key in the message is that if anybody ever changes the message, they will get a different uniformly random, this is called a nonce, a different uniformly random k value. Um, and if they don't change the message, they will just produce exactly the same signature. So even though you're like repeating your randomness, the, the upshot of that is that you're repeating your signature which is not, I mean, anyone can copy and paste a signature. A question you might ask is, is what about your secret key itself? Does that have to be uniformly random? Uh, as near as I can tell, the answer is no. I mean, don't, I mean, don't do that because I said as near as I can tell, the answer is no. But seriously, like, it seems like the answer is no, right? It just needs to be, needs to have sufficient entropy that nobody can guess it. And in practice, it seems like this is actually secure. And that's kind of surprising, because you read a paper, you've got that arrow dollar sign symbol saying, draw your secret key uniformly randomly, draw your nonce uniformly randomly. The first one is kind of just advice. The second one, uh, if you violate it, even by less than one bit out of 256, you will lose all of your keys. So um, that's the kind of thing that, that really surprises you in real life when, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't surprise you when you read it. It surprises you when you try to implement it when you're trying to write code and, uh, and people keep breaking your stuff in ways that the paper didn't say they could. So um, moving on, um, 
let me talk about one extension. I have two extensions to Schnorr that I want to talk about. Um, one of which is this, this thing called sign the contract, which I'll kind of rush through. The other one is multi-signatures, which I'm going to rush through even more. Um, and all I want to do is highlight the security properties of this. So there's this construction called sign the contract, where you take a signature, you have this, uh, this value r called a public nonce, I guess. It's actually just k times g, where g is some elliptic curve generator. Um, you can turn r into a commitment. You can kind of like hide data in the blockchain using this. You can timestamp data in a blockchain. What you do is you take your nonce, you just do your normal signature thing, you compute this nonce r, you hash the nonce along with some other secret message that you want to like covertly sign. And then you add that to the original r, and then you use this new object, um, which I guess I'm calling r, the original is r0. You use this new object as your nonce in your signature. This works, it's easy, um, it's algebraically trivial, um, and it seems very powerful. What this lets you do is take a signature on a transaction or something, and it secretly becomes a signature on some other auxiliary data. So now you can sign that like, this transaction represents whatever metadata you want. You can sign like, the current state of your wallet as like, a time stamping mechanism. You can just take arbitrary data from people and, and basically anchor it into the blockchain this way and get a time stamp for zero space, which is great. Um, and this seems really straightforward. You can see that the only way I've changed the signature scheme is by modifying this object R which is public data, so surely you should be able to tweak it and not have anything bad be happening, right? I'm not messing with any secret keys here. There's nothing secret in what I've changed. So, um, and you can see the final signature there. I've just added this hash there, whatever. Um, so how could this go wrong for me? If all you're doing is tweaking, right? We don't even need a security model, right? Because all we're doing is tweaking public data. Well, it's a verification equation again. Well, here's the thing. So in the last slide, I said, hey, uniform randomness is hard. Why don't we generate our nonce by hashing a secret key in a message? Well, if you have a hardware wallet or something that's doing that, and then you ask it to do the signed a contract construction, you say, hey, the next signature that you make, I want you not only to sign this message, I want you to also commit to this other object. Um, if the wallet is generating a secret nonce by hashing the real message and a secret key, then if you ask it for signatures with multiple signatures on the same message, but different commitments, you can actually solve the resulting <coughs> signatures and extract the secret key. Okay, and the reason is in these equations, which I'm not going to go into. So already there's something where like, oops, we have to think a bit harder about this. And the awful thing is that this is not even something that might be caught by a security model in a published paper. The reason being that the vulnerability comes from our replacing our uniformly random nonces with some sort of hash function in a way that we argued was correct for single signatures, and that was like intuitively and, and also like very uh, well reviewed and audited, in a way that is actually correct for single signatures. And like this seems kind of trivial, right? You take a random function, you replace it with a hash. What could be simpler than that? And then here we are, we try to add something unrelated. We're just tweaking public data. What could go wrong? And somehow these two things interact, and now you've leaked your secret key again. So there's a solution. This is what the solution looks like. I'm just going to mention these four things. The first three cause you to lose your keys. The fourth one, I think, saves you. Um, and it just took many iterations. Every time we would try something to prevent this, basically something would go wrong. Um, and I, I would like to say more about this, but it's, it's, I want to move on as well. So, so let's talk about multi-signatures real quickly. Um, multi-signatures are cool. And this is actually the big reason that we want Schnorr in Bitcoin versus the existing ECDSA is that this nice simple equation I showed you on the first slide has some nice algebraic properties. Specifically, you can just add, if you have a whole bunch of people producing signatures, you can just add them together and the result will be something that you can verify was a sum of signatures, okay? And so if you tweak this add a bunch of signatures thing slightly and you say, well, what if everybody uses the same E? So in the middle of the slide, I have this E equals a hash of public key nonce message. If everybody uses the same challenge to, um, to create a signature and you add those together, you will actually get a single signature on a single message with a single public key where that public key is jointly controlled by all the different participants. And this is really straightforward. You can see I took my, my first thing, my first slide, I just said, well, now everybody's going to do this independently. And then at each step, they, uh, they tell each other what they did, then everyone adds up what, what everyone gave them. Um, you do that twice, and then you get a signature. So that was a multi-signature. Super straightforward, super fast, algebraically simple, it's clearly correct. Is it secure? Well, I mean, sure it's secure, right? I mean, you can see the signature is the same as the original Schnorr signature, so what could go wrong? 
Um, and and look, you can always you can just verify. So this is the, the real cool thing about Schnorr, is that your ver the difference between signing and verification is literally just these little Gs here. And I apologize for not giving any introduction to elliptic curve cryptography before saying that and smiling. But you know, if, if you're familiar, you'll appreciate this. Um, so, well, the thing about a signature being secure is not just that, for a multi-signature, it's not just that nobody can forge, right? Now you have to think about all these different signers. You have a whole collection of signers, and you, none of them individually control the entire signing key, right? So now you want to think, well, what if one of them is bad? Well, what if all of them are bad? Well, if all of them are bad, you're back to like your attacker chooses the key. That's kind of boring. But if all but one is bad, that's something interesting. Suppose you have one honest signer in the middle of a multi-signature. What can happen to them? And also, um, suppose you have one honest signer, and he's being asked to use the same key, or even related keys or something, in multiple multi-signatures going on at the same time. So one thing that differed between this and the first slide is that there are multiple rounds here. And so you can think about doing stuff in parallel. You can think about being adaptive and saying, based on what the honest guy did in the first round of all of these, now I'm going to do something bad. I'm going to somehow manipulate his responses or, or something like that. It, uh, it really makes the security model more complicated. And um, what, do I, and what, what I kind of want to say here is that when I start layering on all these different things that an attacker can do in a multi-signature setting, we're moving away from the intuition from the first couple of slides that we somehow defined the most powerful attacker that we can. It's, sort of, it's starting to feel a little, it should be making you uncomfortable, it's starting to feel like I'm kind of listing a bunch of attacks and saying, well, we're going to define our attacker to be able to do these specific attacks that I can think of and not any of the ones that I can't think of. We're no longer doing like every, like, every attacker can do these very general things, just request whatever they want and do whatever they want. So that should make you a bit uncomfortable. Um, but I'm not going to go into that, I'm just gonna say that's, that's life you get. You wind up with your security models, those multi-party protocols that are really long and you have to review the security model really carefully, even in the pure academic setting. So in fact, this, the scheme that I described, everybody adds everything, is insecure. It's insecure in multiple ways. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about, because I'm out of time, uh, is simply that your attacker can choose their key adaptively. Suppose that you have one, um, suppose even that you have one attacker, and then you've got like a whole bunch of honest people, and your attacker and your honest people all want to produce a signature together. Then, um, then the attacker can wait for everyone else to provide their public keys, and then it will just make up a public key on its own. And it will subtract off everyone else's and say, hey, my public key is this difference here. And, um, and then when you add these all together, when you get a summed public key, the result is just the attacker's key by itself. So something that everybody in the signing protocol thinks is a multi-signature key is actually just a single signer key um, controlled by the attacker. Um, and then, so there are a few iterations of, um, of ways to prevent this that we went through. In the end, what we did um, in a signature scheme called MuSig, which is a multi-signature scheme that works, that produces Schnorr signatures, is basically you hash everybody's public keys together. And then every individual signer, when they contribute their public key, they are required to hash their index in the signing session with that hash of everyone's keys. And it turns out that prevents these kind of attacks. But then there's another attack, which I dreamed I would have enough time to go into, and I'm, I'm, I really don't. But basically, there's another attack where there's a parallel attack. Your attacker um, waits for everybody to choose their Rs. Um, they open like a thousand signing sessions in parallel. They wait for all the honest people to choose their R values, their nonces. And then somehow they are able to basically grind their choice of nonces in a way that they can make a whole bunch of the E's from all, from like 999 of these sessions. They can get a whole bunch of those E's to add up to an E from the 1,000th session. And basically they get a free signature out of it. And they're able to produce a forgery by doing enough parallel attacks. Or sorry, by doing enough parallel signing sessions, they're able to get like one more parallel signing session. And that was something that we actually didn't see. We managed to publish a paper. We got it almost all the way through the peer review process before somebody else uh, published a paper responding to our preprint saying, hey guys, your, uh, your scheme. They didn't say it was insecure, actually. They said that the proof technique we had used in our paper provably could not be used to prove any our signature scheme secure under the assumptions they were using. It's like this meta reduction that proved that our paper had to be wrong. And this is really kind of a punch. I mean, it's one thing if your thing is wrong, but for somebody to publish a proof that you can't possibly be right, 
<laughs> is, I mean, it's really like, unfair, right? <laughs> but that's what they did. Um, and then six months later, they found an actual attack. It, it was insecure. Um, and we were able to fix it. The fix is actually fairly straightforward. The issue is that the attacker chooses uh, their nonce after everybody else chooses their nonce. So you add a, a pre-commit phase to your signature protocol. So now everybody exchanges a hash of their nonce. Then everybody exchanges their nonces, adds them up. Then everybody exchanges their signatures, adds them up. And, uh, and you're good. So that's all that I have. Um, whoops, that's not the right direction. So thank you all for listening. I've got a minute or two for questions, maybe. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, they've got these mics. Uh, so there's another fun thing you can do with signatures, and that is you can generate the signature using a random number generator and then compute the public key. Yes. Now, this is used in Ethereum, right? So the way you check an, a check an address in Ethereum is you use the EC recover function, you calculate the public key, you hash it, find the address. Um, the second thing you can do with it is you can actually uh, create a transaction, pre-sign it by doing this, and then essentially it's, it's one of the mechanisms to implement covenants without having uh, any on-chain logic. Um, the choices you guys have had to make here in terms of keeping the thing secure have made that impossible. Uh, so my question is, uh, is that like a, a final statement, as in like this is always going to be insecure to compute a public key from a signature? And or uh, is there any vulnerability in Ethereum because it uses this pretty fundamentally? Cool. Um, great questions. So the, the question is about this thing called pub key recovery, where you produce a signature. Anyone given a signature can figure out what pub key was used um, to produce that signature, assuming that the signature does not hash the public key in the way that I described. And the thing with Schnorr signatures is that um, the algebra required for public key recovery and the algebra required to do the attack I hinted at with BIP32 children are actually one and the same. Okay, so if Ethereum were to use Schnorr signatures and try to do this pub key recovery mechanism like this, it would actually be insecure to use BIP32 as described with Ethereum. But Ethereum today is using ECDSA, which is algebraically quite different from Schnorr, and it appears to be different enough from Schnorr in this respect that actually there is no vulnerability caused by pub key recovery. But my argument for that is not that there has been like a paper published that demonstrates some sort of resilience against the attack. The argument, like with everything with ECDSA, is basically that a lot of us spent a long time banging our heads against the algebra and got frustrated and gave up. Um, so to answer your meta question about like, is this really like a hard stance that I'm taking against pub key recovery, um, well, accidentally against pub key recovery because I want to be hashing these public keys, the answer is yes. It's just very, it's very scary, especially with Schnorr where you have these linear equations that now uh, grant the ability to make your signatures much more flexible. It seems like we're getting a lot of these, like, um, if we don't commit to the public key, we get blindsided even more by like weird attacks that you don't think are part of your security model until you're in Bitcoin where like keys are being generated in weird ways and related in weird ways and, and you've got limited hardware. So yeah, I'm, so I'm pretty uh, hard line about that. So um, can you talk about uh, how threshold ECDSA multisigs uh, lately have been proposed by Princeton, the Princeton team, uh, compared to Snore as well as BLS? Um, yeah, very quickly. Um, you can produce threshold Snor signatures. So I believe the threshold signatures um, proposed by Princeton, if you're talking about the paper, I believe you are. Uh, the threshold DC, the fast threshold DCDSA. Oh, something. fast threshold DCDSA. Yes. Um, so very briefly, you can do threshold signatures that output Snor signatures. You can do threshold signatures that output ECDSA signatures. On a very high level, these are essentially the same. And the level of details, the ECDSA ones are extremely complicated. Um, they take you know, thousands of times as long to compute. They require some non-trivial, like non-EC cryptography to be doing. Um, the implementation complexity is much higher, um, and there's just a lot more risk related to that. With Schnorr, it's much more straightforward. I have a, another talk that I did recently at the SF Bitcoin Devs meetup um, in San Francisco uh, that describes how to do it in like slides like these, where I was able to fit all the algebra onto one slide. Um, BLS um, is conceptually much simpler um, but it's slower to verify. 
And that's, I think, all that I have time to say. I mean, I, I could give a whole talk comparing these different things, but it is slower to verify and requires some new crypto assumptions. Is this half Bitcoin dev stock? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Andrew. Cool.